Hello, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or whenever you happen to be watching this video. This is yet another in a series of educational talks from me uh, based on primarily the syllabus of the uh, award in education and training at level three. But it could also be really useful for anyone who is involved in uh, training and teaching generally who wants to brush up on their skills or someone who's doing a higher level course and wants some extra material. I'm going to talk today about the whole process of communication and you may ask, ask the question why exactly that should be the case. Well, primarily I see teaching and learning as founded in the material instance of communication. To teach and to learn is to be engaged in communication in the most fundamental sense. I suppose it's a little bit like seeing communication as the process by which any kind of learning takes place. Communication in this sense is between two, two or more human beings. It's, as the saying goes, interpersonal and also invol involves a considerable amount of what you might call intrapersonal information. That's to say the business of how an individual interprets the world around them based upon their history, their culture, their sense of self and so on and so forth. So when we talk about communication we're not just dealing with whatever happens in the world around us and as we um, pass on ideas and concepts from ourselves to others, we also have to take into account the kind of people we are to start off with as we make these particular communicational systems active. Secondary, in order to understand that, we also have to understand that communication is a simultaneous and, 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 and multi-channeled affair. So simultaneous, uh, simultaneously, I, I mean in the sense that in a, most systems, probably not in this one, but certainly in most systems, you are receiving information in the same way as you're sending it. The process of sending and reception is simultaneously going on all the time. And this is probably true if you're working with somebody or you're living with somebody or you're in a close relationship with anybody for, for that matter. You realize that when you're communicating with them, they're also communicating with you one way or another. And say multi-channeled, because this is not just about the business of talk. It's also about the business, of, for instance, of signs, of signals, of things like appearance, what somebody looks like, not just them, their being of a certain facial type and so on and so forth, but also their cultural background, the things they bring with them. These channels of communication are, they always come with any message that's being sent. You cannot avoid it. It's, it's very much in the way of, of, of the famous saying by Marshall McLuhan that the medium is the message. In other words, the medium by which a message is sent has as much bearing on how it's interpreted by someone at the other end as it would be as, as it would be the content of the message was in, was interpreted. So what you're getting is not just based upon the information pure and simple, but also the way I'm saying it, how I'm saying it, da 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 and your background that filters and interprets how that message is, 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 is assimilated, as you might say, into your life conditions. The history of this goes back a long, fairly long, fairly long way, at least back as, as to the first great information theory technolo technolo technological model that came out in 1948 by a guy called Claude Shannon, an American mathematician and technologist. He was wanting to produce a method of describing how communication happened that would be useful in terms of the increasing use of technological channels of communication like radio, TV, and so on and so forth that were, were, that were growing at that particular time. As it happens, his systems proved to be really important because not only were they applicable to technology, but they were also applicable to human interactions as well. And the model is a useful way of taking on board how people see each other and communicate with each other. And also it flags up a great deal about why 
miscommunication and misunderstandings can happen. You can, I would recommend, take a look at some of my handouts on the subject and particularly look at a, a, a handout that gives you the cyclic vision of, of Shannon's work. Later on, after Shannon came up with this particular model, another guy called Warren Weaver uh, helped in publicizing it and simplifying it and making it accessible to a wider range of people. Consequently, the, the, the model is often referred to as the Shannon Weaver model, though really it's the Shannon model. There is another guy called Norbert Wiener who actually added an extra element to the, the model, which we'll talk about later on, called feedback. And so it's, if you want to be really literate, one literate or, or pedantic is the word I'm looking for communication issue there then it's really the Shannon Weaver Wiener Shannon's confusing Shannon Weaver and Wiener model we're talking about and you know well, there you go SWW so how does it work well the model posits a sender of a piece of information and a recipient these the sender and recipient are two human beings, but they could be crowds of human beings, they could be nation states, they could be almost anything that's sending information and receiving it. And as I said earlier on, these are most human communications are simultaneous and, in, and, and, and happen at the same time, especially in occasion, on occasions when we're dealing with feedback, as we will do later on. But let's consider an individual communicating with another individual. Someone, the person who's sending the message has an idea or a concept that they want to send to the other person. And the process of doing that, they have to think about two things which, uh, with, with Shannon considered, considered to be vital to the whole process of, of communication. One was encoding and the other one was the channel that was being used to send the message. Now encoding is the process of turning an idea and putting it in a form that can be transmitted. What, what is code? Well, code, most commonly, uh, is, thing, is, is, is what I'm doing now. It's language. Language is a way in which we encode a particular idea or a concept so we can send it to someone else. There are a variety of linguistic codes. Um, I happen to be using English at the moment, but I could have been using French or German or Russian or Chinese or, you know, depending on my background, cultural knowledge and all the rest of it that goes with it. So encoding is part of that process. A code doesn't have to be language. It could also be signals. It could be things like smiling or frowning or grimacing or various other human body language signals that are sent. In other words, it could be encoded via the business of sight to another person, similarly to using the process of sound sight and sound are the media through which this encoding process happens. In other words, what they are, a sight and sound, are the channels that are used. For human beings, we often use multiple channels at the same time. So for instance, in video, you can see me and you can also hear me. That's two channels of communication we're using, two media by which information is being uh, uh, encoded and sent to you. You're also receiving a third one, which is the cultural one of my body language and what I look like and what assumptions you have about me. Even things like the fact I happen to be scratching the back of my neck or wearing a, a, an orange top or has these, these dangly earrings. It's all part of the communication process. And this is quite important when you consider, you conceive of how interpersonal communication operates and it, its importance in terms of the, how human beings understand one another. So we choose an encoding system, we choose a channel and then we transmit the message. The message is transmitted through these channels and in the process of being uh, transmitted it may encounter something called noise. What is noise? Well noise could be literally noise. For instance, I could be talking to you in the, and uh, you're listening to this with a very noisy background going on behind you. You could be, you could be sitting on a bus somewhere with the noise of the engine loud in your ears and you find it difficult to hear what I'm saying. Or you could be distracted by something else while you're listening. Distraction is noise. Or you could be in a state of emotional panic. Something's happened to you today. You're feeling put out. 
you're feeling angry about something, you're feeling nervous or anxious. That also is noise. Anything that interferes in the process of the message coming from me to you is considered to be noise. And it's not just the business of the kind of noise you would imagine you hear on a in a radio transmitter. You know, you've ever, ever listened to the radio, especially shortwave radio, and you hear all this whistling going on in the background, you know, from the cosmic microwave background radiation and stuff of that sort. Uh, uh, or if we would have sometimes been watching TV and the, the picture flickers. That's noise in, in technological terms. But there is also noise in human terms. And that noise can interfere in how someone interprets an encoded message transmitted over a channel. If the channel has been interfered with, consider this. Supposing someone's knowledge of English isn't so good. That's noise that in a sense interferes with the message that I'm sending. I would then, if I know that somebody has this problem with their knowledge of English, have to modify my message by choosing a different kind of encoding, perhaps a different language, the language they understand, in order to make sure that my message was understandable. So we encode, we choose a channel, we transmit, there may be noise. The person at the other end receives this, this message, hopefully through the same channel, hopefully. Depends what channels are available to them, really, at the end of the day. And then has to decode it. It's in the decoding process where most information loss and misunderstandings take place. Because encoding is not a perfect process. Encoding depends on what a person already knows, is willing to accept, and can make of the information that's been sent. So consider this. Supposing I send a perfectly understandable message in terms of the way I, I believe it to be the case, and I'm sending something which in, in many ways is, 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 um, is understandable, but maybe I use some complicated words that I don't explain. Maybe I use jargon. The person who receives the message may understand it perfectly as English, but may not know the meaning of some of the words. Therefore, their decoding of that message will be faulty. It will not be as clear as it might be. They may even, if they're the kind of person who is afraid of being shown up as being not as clever as they would like everybody else to believe, may not wish to ask the other person concerned to explain the term they've used and just make an assumption. In the process of doing that, an extra layer of decoding in practicality is created by misidentifying and mistranslating a particular piece of code that's been sent. Consider another issue about decoding. Supposing the other person has a prejudice, prejudice against transgender people, for instance, their attitude may reject out of hand some of the terminology I use. So, for instance, if I was talking about being transgender and I sent a message which used the words uh, sex as, is, as an interpretation of biology and gender as being an interpretation of the way sex operates in society and the person concerned was f a firm believer in the idea that sex and gender are exactly the same things and just a different kind of way of saying, this, saying the same thing that it's possible that when they decode my message what they'll be doing is misinterpreting it, interpreting it. So that process of decoding that is where Norbert Wiener's idea of feedback becomes vitally important. When a message has been received, there needs to be some feedback from recipient to show whether there has been any understanding. That process of feedback can take the place of, for instance, simply copying back the message in a, in a reinterpreted way to show what meaning has been in has been understood, or it could be in the process of just saying, yes, I understood that, or it could be in the process of asking questions. What is vitally important is the feedback needs to give some assurance that the message was interpreted in the way that the transmitter <laughs> was intended it to, be, it meant to be interpreted. What comes over very strongly from this, and I think this is a piece of understanding that's often missed in communication theory is that the meaning of any message is in the person concerned it's not in the code the code can be translated and decoded 
as English can be in many different ways. It can, in fact, be translated and decoded in such a man great number of different ways. I often find it quite incredible that we understand each other at all. Just because we say things doesn't mean to say the other person will understand them. Their, their capacity of understanding English has a, be has a bearing. Their attitudes to the, trans the person making the transmission has a bearing. Their capacity to be able to decodes complicated terminology has a bearing and their willingness to accept the message has a bearing as well a person for instance who feels the message is threatening may deliberately though they don't know it misinterpret the message simply because it saves their ego so feedback is vital feedback is part of the transmission process it's vitally important that when you say something to a student it's you know you we do do it a lot you get feedback to show that they didn't in fact understand it never assume they do because what's pretty clear is they often don't i had an, an a, a kind of comical and quite embarrassing aspect of that uh, some a long time ago i was teaching uh, information technology to a bunch of beginners who had never used a computer before and i noticed someone one of my students a lady was having difficulty using the mouse you know mice this thing uh, and I was uh, placing the mouse on the table and showing her how it was supposed to work. And then I, I having, having assumed, this is where my fault lay, having assumed that she knew what I was on about, I said, point to the start button, because we were using Windows, point to the start button. And I assumed she would interpret that as taking the mouse pointer across the screen and putting it on top of the button marked start at the bottom left hand, or hand corner of the, of, the, of, the, of the computer screen. But she didn't. What she did was she took her finger and pointed. Communication failure. My terminology, which was point to, I should have said, use the move the mouse button, move the mouse pointer so it points to the button at the bottom left hand corner but she interpreted it in the way that you would interpret it that pointing was something you do with your finger so you get the idea that that you know teaching needs very clear communication and the fact that it doesn't it's a mystery that people learn anything at all learning is about communication as i was saying earlier on that means at the end of the day we need to have some key points developed here. Firstly, that it, to remember that the understanding, the meaning of any message is part and parcel of the person themselves, not part and parcel of the message. The message doesn't carry anything except code. It, when I speak, I make noises at you. Okay? This all this flapping around with my mouth and waving my hands about. I'm making noises at you. How you interpret those noises is a lot to do with who you are, what your background is, where you come from, what your attitudes are, and so on and so forth. The message itself contains nothing except noise, except the noises, and also the noise that comes with it. That's one thing. Secondly, that feedback is vital because with feedback, wish I could get it now, but I can't. With feedback, you can tell me if what, what I'm, what you, what what you've understood is is the same as what I understood by just recounting it back to me, by telling me what it is that you got out of the message. She says, bouncing the the, the, the laptop up and down on her knee. The third thing about all this is it is it re, it sort of revitalizes the idea that human interaction is part and parcel of the foundation of learning, and that human interaction is often based upon speech and often based upon talking and often based upon all the annexes of speech and talking that go with it, including gesturing and what I'm dressed like, what I sound like, what my background is that you know those sorts of things give the context inside which these channels of communication these encoded systems provide you with something which adds to the meanings that you gather about the world those processes 
are well they're just the core of what teaching and learning is don't get that if you don't get that right then being able to write good lesson plan and being able to learn about stuff inside your subject area are totally useless a great teacher is someone who's got a handle on communication knows how it works can set up circumstances in which we keep the amount of background noise low as possible and that includes emotional and psychological noise and raises the amount of feedback and what's called introduces redundancy into the message. What do I mean by redundancy? Redundancy means that I transmit the message by multiple channels at the same time. I can say it, I can give you a picture, I can give you a video, I can draw it on a board, I can write it down, I can give you a handout, I can point you to a website. These are all extra channels of information on top of the business of me saying what I say. They are termed redundant in the sense that essentially just saying it would in perfect circumstances be enough but it's not because I cannot be certain that the other person doesn't have problems with those channels of information or can't receive them. For instance how do I know that you're not lip reading at this very moment and that you're deaf? You may be. How do I know that at the end of the day your knowledge of English may be quite poor because it's your second language? In which case wouldn't it be better if there was something translated into your into your language available available to you? Which is right. In other words, what in doing that, what I'm offering you is the idea that in 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 su superior communication, as you might want to call it, we have redundancy built in. This is, <laughs> I, I don't need to express how often this is forgotten, you know. We're often asked to use, uh, you know, in the current circumstances, use Zoom in order to do our teaching. But what we also need to do is to remember we need these redundant channels to make sure that, that the message that we're transmitting can be received via other systems. So this this, though you we you know I will teach a session on this very subject of, of communication this video is here as a backup channel a backup channel of communication which may help and there will also be handouts on the subject and I can point individuals towards websites which, which discuss it at greater length in multiple you know multiple uh, uh, languages because there are always subtitles available and stuff of that sort. So there is a sense that increasing the number of channels in which a message is being transmitted helps enormously. Psychologically speaking this has also a big impact upon a large number of other sectors of the environment in terms of uh, the you know the kind of roles that people have got. It's not the teaching and learning where it's important. It has a great bearing on things like counselling as well. You know if we're involved in counselling the fundamental thing here is a call, often called a talking therapy and in the business of talking it's so important that the process of understanding is teased out as counsellor works because of the way in which the Shannon model illustrates things like how in, you know noise can get in the way and now we're not just talking about physical noise here we're also talking about the business of the psychological noise of the stress someone may be under the conditions under which they're they're, they're having to tell a story perhaps and the processes in which they encounter the counsellor in other words the room <laughs> what the counsellor looks like how the counsellor reacts to a person transmits a psychological message which at the end of the day has a bearing on how the story the person wants to tell is told it's the same with politics politicians should know about communication don't always do it very well. They don't do it very well because they forget about the redundancy of channels. They forget about the business of receiving feedback and sometimes don't even want feedback because when they receive feedback, if it's a negative feedback, they'd rather it was not there. And yet human beings do not understand if there isn't any way of confirming their understanding as being valid valid communication in the sense of something which is confirmed by feedback strikes me as the most important aspect of making sure that whatever message has been transmitted from one place to another 
is clearly understood. One of the things that, for instance, has been common during the, the recent pandemic has been the whole business of, of, of people understanding the rules of how their, you know, their behaviour affects the spread of the coronavirus. And if the rules are really complicated, then they're more liable to be mistrans to be mis misdecoded, decoded badly by the person concerned, and confusion reigns. And of course, that can have bearing upon human lives. It's important. I mean, when this life is at stake, that the message is clear, that it's easily understandable, and that it's pr it's promoted via multiple redundant channels and the process of noise, psychological, physical, emotional, oh, yeah, etc. Noise is kept to a minimum in order to make the clarity of the message decodable at the other end. I hope that this video has provided you with a considerable amount of food for thought. I have to say to you that this is one of my favourite subjects and the reason why it's one of my favourite subjects is because it set me off on a whole sort of half lifetime in endeavour in trying to understand how human communication works. For instance one of the things that led me to was an interest in the philosophy of language. I've taken a huge interest in the work of Wittgenstein and all the people who are involved in, 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 in the concept of what language is. And his ideas about language games are another way of, I suppose, interpreting the Shannon model in, in its, its technical side. You know, the idea that a, la a game of language that we play with one another, both physical and oral and visual and sensory in all sorts of ways, is all about this business of, uh, of, of an exchange of ideas which tries to establish a common ground for information sharing. And that process is, to a certain extent, like a game. It has, it has its own rules, Shannon's rules, and it has its own processes for its success or failure. And Wittgenstein was pursuing that road down in the post-1948 era. It's not surprising that when he came up with his philosophy in, in, in his book, Philosophical Investigations, it was after the period of, 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 of Claude Shannon. I've also taken a great interest in, in the whole process of how education is founded upon uh, uh, communication and, and the issue of communication itself as a, as a specialism which I think teachers need to make far more inform, inform, in, emphasis on than they do. I've, for instance, discovered that, that the old taboo about lecturing is probably overdone. It is true that one should avoid lecturing. But it's also true that the business of verbal communication has its contextual, contextual worth in the sense that if you have a lot of information to put over in a short space of time, then it's probably the most efficient way of doing it. And sometimes, you may, may have gathered it here, it's often a way of putting over something in a very passionate way, which other means do not do. So there is an effective way of teaching and learning in which a lecture, a short one, no more than 20 minutes, plus or minus five perhaps, plays a big part, as long as it's not something you do all the time. And I think there is no harm in that. I think there's no harm in that because of the way in which human beings communicate clearly indicates that at the end of it all, there is room for what I'm doing right now, as long as it's not overblown. So with that little Philip, as you might say, for those of us who are prone to talk too much, and I'm one of them, can I console you by saying as long as you're engaging with the business of trying to communicate through other means, and as long as there is feedback, as long as there is feedback, which is part of the model, remember, then I think we shouldn't have too much problem with all of that. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. And I uh, look forward to speaking to you again in the not-too-distant future. Bye-bye for now.